Grace and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I don't know when you read your devotions, Stephanie and I usually do so before bed, but if you've already looked at it, today's verse is familiar because it was the theme verse for today's devotion. And even if not, if you've been to the other Wednesday services, you've heard this verse every time that we've gone through Psalm 41. And as we noted at the beginning of Lent, all of Psalm 41 is not only David's prayer, not only our prayer, but it is also the prayer of our Lord Jesus. Some of the verses we can see more plainly in his life than others, such as tonight's. My enemies say of me in malice, when will he die and his name perish? That's harsh. Maybe you sometimes said in anger that you wish somebody were dead or somebody has said it about you. Of course, we know that for us to harbor such thoughts is the same thing in Jesus' mind as murder. He tells us that flat out. When you hate your brother, you have already committed murder. But here, David can say it because he has enemies, both some of the people outside with whom Israel is still fighting, and also within his own house, among his own people. He has jealous children. He has palace intrigues. When he was made king, that didn't mean that some of the family of Saul didn't want to try putting their family back on the throne. And there would be others at times. There would be those always who thought they knew better than David. And others who just were jealous for power and prestige. The story we remember the most probably is that of his son Absalom and getting his hair caught in the branch and then killed by one of David's commanders. But that wasn't the only one. David was looking over his own shoulder for much of his adult life. Remember that even before he was king, he was hiding at times from Saul. Saul, who called him in, who encouraged him and then got angry with him because the people liked David more than they did him. You can say it, of course, of yourself at times, too. Perhaps not to this degree, but there's always somebody who wants you out of their way for one reason or another. Even if it's not a permanent thing, just because you're driving slower than they are, you're keeping the line at the store longer, even the petty little things like that can bring out petty little hatreds of other people. But to be really hated like this, <coughs> do you have any enemies to this degree? Do you have someone who wishes that you were dead and that your name would perish? Well, actually, you do. Satan himself wishes that you were dead and in his clutches forevermore. He wishes that you would surrender already here and be spiritually dead for the rest of your life on earth so it's guaranteed that you have no life of any good and blessing hereafter. The world itself can do just fine without you, and there are times when it works actively against you, especially as a believer. There are people who hate the church and hate individual Christians all over this world, in our land, throughout the Americas, Europe, Asia. It doesn't matter if there are people, there are people who hate our Lord and who hate Christians. And sometimes we even hate ourselves. A lot of times it's a matter of despair, of recognizing our sinfulness, but forgetting that our sins are forgiven. Shame and darkness can cloud our minds, and sometimes those thoughts, those feelings go so deep that people actually take their own lives. They hate themselves so much. People are surrounded by enemies. But Jesus then takes this also for himself. He prays this psalm in his earthly life, and he knows how it's going to end. My enemies say of me in malice. Not just, we wish he wasn't here, but deep, dark hatred. When will he die? And when will his name perish? Two separate questions, though. The enemies don't realize that. For them, it's redundant. And whether it's Jesus praying it or us, there's a short answer to it. Anytime in Jesus' entire life on earth, 
Finally, when you look at the entire span of history, when was Jesus going to die? Soon. He wasn't going to live to be an old man because he was going to go to the cross to suffer. When was he going to die? At the exact time that God appointed. A time that Jesus knew, but the rest of the people around him know. His enemies didn't. His friends didn't. When it got closer, his disciples had a better and better idea, and his enemies had a bigger and bigger hope. That last week in Jerusalem after Palm Sunday, especially, his enemies must have just been rubbing their hands in anticipation. We've got him now. We know he always stays in Jerusalem throughout the feast, so let's make sure we get him. But only when he's not surrounded by the crowds. They figured that Jesus' time on earth was short. And they were right, weren't they? And when Jesus starts telling his disciples, especially after his transfiguration, what was coming, and he kept building it up and building up, the Son of Man must suffer many things at the hands of evil people. He must suffer. He must die. And they forgot all too often about the last line, and on the third day be raised again. The haters were going to hate, and they were going to get their hooks into Jesus. But you know what? He did die. Exactly as the prophets foretold, exactly as he had been saying, as God's own word, that word who rides the white horse in our reading from Revelation, that word incarnate, that word of God that both smites and heals, He'd been saying it all along. He'd inspired it to be said by David and by the prophets, and he would live up to everything that he inspired. But when did his name pass away from this earth? When did Jesus' name perish? Think hard about that. Dig deep. Because you aren't going to find it, are you? The name of Jesus has not perished and will not perish. He has the name that is above all names, a name at which every knee must bow that last day, a name that is written on each one of us in our baptisms. He is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He is the Word of God incarnate, and he is from everlasting to everlasting. And so when Jesus prays these words, he knows the whole story. Yes, I am going to die. From the time he is conceived in Mary's womb, the clock is ticking. But he also knows that his name will not perish from this earth because his kingdom will not perish from this earth. His people will not perish from this earth until this earth is undone and redone, holy and perfect, top to bottom, inside and out. And when you are saying this psalm, then, you can say it right along with Jesus. When will you die? Well, I can say soon because however long you have left to live on this earth, as you are and as it is, compared to how long this earth has stood and how many lives have come and gone, that three score years and ten or perhaps four score years sometimes seems like an awful long time even. And soon enough, you will die. And perhaps even, in the minds of many people, your name will perish. It'll be like one of those old tombstones that you see, that even if you try rubbing paper on it, you can't make out the words anymore. But your name does not truly perish as long as it is held in the Lamb's book of life. As long as God knows your name, your name is alive and well, and you with it. Your name will never perish because God will not let it. That's why you are baptized. That's why you are forgiven. That's why he calls you to be his own so that he can remember you. Not only your days as you walk this earth, but also as you leave this earth. Because even if you leave life on this earth, you have not left the Lord. And the Lord will never leave you. Your enemies can say all they want, whether the big, bad, sin, death, and devil ones, whether it's your own evilness within you at one time or another. People 
can wish ill for you. People can bring ill upon you, but they cannot blot your name out from God. As he says through the prophet, he's engraved your name on the palms of his hands. He has written you deeply in his own heart and mind. And he cannot, will not, unremember you. This verse is a call for you to remember that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. But it's also a call to remember that you are of God. You're his child. And to him you shall return. And in him you shall live forever and ever. And so we don't fear the ticking clock. Christians aren't called to count down until the end, but rather to measure each day by what's in it and to give thanks for whatever we have in this life. Blessings large and small, even the worries and the troubles and the problems that we have as God challenges us to depend on him and his strength rather than ourselves and our own strength. It may be hundreds, thousands, or more years until this world ends. And maybe our graves will join those other ones where there's nothing left of the writing that you can make out. But even if that's the case, God sees your name clearly, God sees your face clearly, and God sees exactly when he's raising you up and calling you to live with him forever. God grant the steadfastness of faith and the joy of knowing that your name cannot be blotted out. Your name cannot be removed from the book of life. You cannot be taken away from your God in Christ Jesus. In his name, amen. The peace that surpasses understanding keep you in Christ Jesus. Amen.